Good evening, everybody. And I'm going to be speaking for a few minutes just so that everybody would be able to get in tune with how I talk. Um, so that you can follow my arguments and my observations. I would like to begin by acknowledging the following eminent university administrators who made it possible for me to be here. They did this by guaranteeing and continuing to provide resources for the Nelson Mandela professorship. I would like to make a plea to them to ensure the long-term continuity and viability of the professorship, which is to say, please don't let it stop. I would like to acknowledge the Vice Chancellor, Professor Sizwe Mabizela, for a successful tenure and diligently maintaining the stellar standards of the university. Knowing what has happened to universities in many parts of the continent, it's a testament to his credit that he is maintaining the standards. So I would like to say that the success, in my view, is attributable to him being a passionate lover of jazz, a musical structure and experience that intensifies creative problem solving skills. How do I know he's a lover of jazz? FBI, CIA. I also acknowledge the Dean of Humanities, Dr. Innocent Nsindu who in the few days I have been here, I learned that he's a great cheerleader and enthusiastic supporter of the humanities. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. I also want to especially recognize the head of the Department of Political Science and International Studies, Associate Professor Sifokazi, Sifokazi Magadla. Where should I begin? Professor Magadla, you are truly an African sister. A gem in the truest sense of the word. You looked around the world filled with many highly accomplished African women and you chose someone at the margins of scholarship unabashedly proclaiming the importance and value of African knowledge system. Your decision is a testimony of your intellectual courage since many would run away in haste, believing that Africa has very little to offer. To the faculty of the Department of Political Science and International Studies who endorsed my candidacy for the 2023-2024 Nelson Mandela professorship, I thank you. I also thank all of you who have gone out of your way to make my stay hospitable and welcoming. Dial on. Thank you. Please accept my heartfelt appreciation. I cannot end this tribute without recognizing the students, our future, our professional colleagues in the making, and the reason we are in this profession. It has been a pleasure, a great pleasure, meeting a broad range of students from the department. For those students who are taking a seminar with me, I want you to know this. The seminar so far has been one of the most pleasurable experiences in my teaching career. Having taught exclusively in the United States, it is wonderful to teach a class in which all the students know exactly where Africa is on the map. And you could all easily follow discussions on the nuances of colonialism without making uninformed comments such as, colonialism was good for Africa. And, European colonizers, civilized Africans. Not, nonetheless, 
there is still one shared area of overlap between my American students and my African students here at Rhodes. It is this annoying insistence on utilizing a word I refuse to compromise on and which I am on a mission to banish from the discipline of African studies. And this is T R I B E. Don't make me say that word. As the 2023 Nelson Mandela professor, giving my first public lecture as the holder of this esteemed title, it is an honor and a privilege to give the lecture today, July 18th. You all know that it's Madiba Mandela's birthday. Mandela departed, Madiba departed this world 10 years ago after an incredible life, traveling from the deepest depths of despair to the pinnacle of glory and global adoration. Every year, I teach my students about Madiba and Nomzamo Winnie Madikazela Mandela in a course titled African Intellectual Traditions. To complement the two readings, I select the writings of several astute political thinkers, starting with Emperor Haile Selassie, his speech at the League of Nations, Kwame Nkrumah's writing on neocolonialism, Patrice Lumumba's independence speech, paired with his prime ministerial requests to the United Nations. Thomas Sankara's essay on women's liberation and Amilcar Cabral on national culture. Wangari Matai on environmentalism and the bottlenecks of imperialism. And sometimes I include Tabo Mbeki on African Renaissance and Julius Nyerere on the global debt trap. For the course, I always utilize Madiba's court address at the Riviona trial, which in my view was a masterclass on South African history, served as a defiant address of one prepared to die on his own terms, while at the same time setting the record straight. It was a full-blown address of one unapologetically taking full responsibility for fiercely defending the cause of his people. Since then, Madiba served 27 years in prison with some of his comrades. After his release, he soldiered on to give many resonant speeches on reconciliation that are liberally quoted today, held up as decorated pieces on the pedestal of reconciliation. Those speeches never appealed to me, even though I fully understand their political necessity. You can say that I am your pull down the house and burn it up kind of girl. You cannot have the genuine reconciliation without punishment on a retributive model of justice, which is the operative model of justice in South Africa. You cannot ameliorate the pain and violence inflicted on a brutalized population who were routinely beaten up and jailed arbitrarily, as well as hemmed inside, heavily surveilled and policed open air prisons called townships. While you must have a passport to leave those townships, you must return nightly to the prison. But since I'm not a South African, I do not get to interrogate what South Africans have chosen for themselves. I must respect it. However, I get to decide which Nelson Mandela my students will meet. I want them to meet the Madiba who, after inconceivable patience, finally recognized the necessity of armed struggle to end a recalcitrant rogue racist state. Why Sankofa epistemology? 
South Africa is in a pivotal place. 29 years after the, death, the end of apartheid, the legacy of denigration of African knowledge system persists. The legacy is not just the legacy of apartheid. It is a worldwide one disseminated and fostered by the racialized globalism of the global North. So how do we as Africans living in diverse regions of the world address this global phenomenon where Africans are seen as inferior? Raising the question, I remember my paternal grandmother, Enyi Wabunie Waikego, who died in the mid 1980s at the ripe old age of 104 years. Yeah, she lived over 100. The dispute is that she may have lived to 118. Before her death, when we were much younger, she would speculate about all the stories she would regale her family and friends on the other side when she joined them. She reasoned that they will have a hard time believing some of the stories because in her view, they will sound like extremely tall tales. Our youthful responses were, what tales? What stories? Oh, she will respond. I'll tell them how I will sit down and run at a fast space at the same time. Huh? We will respond. Sit down and run at the same time. We had a hard time comprehending what she was saying. That's a motor car. My bored paternal aunt will chime in. My grandmother would side eye her, her side hike her killjoy daughter and continued. I'll also tell them that whenever I enter a room at dusk, I'll put my hand on the wall and the room will light up, will be filled with light. Oh, we had caught on and proceeded to enjoy the fun. Aha, that's electricity, not ESCO. <laughs> That's electricity, room lights. Okay, for the moment, let's leave aside the question of why she believes it was necessary to explain these technological marvels to deceased ancestors. In our merriment, we forgot to ask her a pertinent question. If indeed they were watching from the other side as the culture declares they are, Shouldn't they have figured out all these things she was talking about? Surely they would have perceived the automobiles while watching over the family. They would or should have perceived the operational functions of the car that we, their descendants, sit in cars while the cars are moving at rapid velocity. We didn't think of these questions. However, her colorful presentation should remind, she's a reminder of another kind of problem, which I need to consider. And that is the issue she was raising may not be simply about ancestors understanding, but about how she is also telling the stories. The latter issue of storytelling is essential to refocus our attention to a preliminary question that must be considered in speaking about Sankofa epistemology. In fact, in proposing Sankofa as an epistemology, by which I mean a theory of knowledge. How do I ensure that I'm not falling into my grandmother's colorful descriptive trap? How do I ensure that the African theory is not a futile exercise, a colorful theorizing that is being made to sound different but cannot contribute substantially to knowledge. In what way is Sankofa epistemology genuinely different from the conventional disciplinary knowledge we use in academia and that presents the global system of knowledge? How is Sankofa epistemology, epistemology different? What are its theoretical features? How are the features charting a different pathway for understanding and knowledge. These questions now take me to my current book project that I'm working on to complete here in my people. A comprehensive overview 
rather than a short paper would provide a clearer explanation of the issues of knowledge that I'm grappling with in shifting the axis of knowledge that emerged out of the enlightenment, which I called endarkenment. Sankofa Epistemology is a book project on a knowledge system that draws extensively on African sapiential philosophy. It began from the awareness that contemporary global knowledge system and its means of production pivot on a Western European axis. The axis and varied logics dictate the constitutive character of knowledge for all of humanity, regardless of space, time, and cultures. Yet the philosophies, epistemic systems, ethical norm, norms, Moral values and social institutional practices of this globalized system are constructed on a doctrine of white supremacy. Any system, ontology, metaphysics, values, interpretations, and explanations that are incompatible with its canons or discordant with their fundamental assumptions are represented as defective or misguided. Since its rise in the 17th century from its economic roots of African enslavement, this white racialized system has attained global hegemonic power. My work is neither historically focused on how this system emerged, nor am I interested in how and why it unfolded. Countless scholars, African-American historians, theorists, and philosophers have tackled the pressing question and pointed out the close parallel of the rise of this system of knowledge with the transatlantic slave trade, the legal enslavement and construction of Africans and the Americans as property, the use of their unremunerated labor in the plantation system of the Americas and the rise of capitalism. Philosophers and legal scholars too have focused on how the legal principles of enslavement of Africans were economically and philosophically rationalized and defended. The theorizations were written into law and religiously backed by Christianity. The end goal of these efforts was to remove Africans from the sphere of humanity. But in pursuant of those objectives, they created political, legal, social, economic, religious, and philosophical norms and concepts that were intricately racialized. From within the depths of this endarkenment rationality that is diversionarily glorified as enlightenment, an extensive corpus of illogical arguments emerged that because of their darker skin pigmentation or color, because of their cultures and their languages, African peoples are non-human. Those theories, concepts, and principles that were created remained intact and retained the logics of their racialization. So the argument is that when you create concepts and the concepts come from a place of darkness, of enslavement where people are constructed as properties, that is what shaped most of the concepts that are deployed in many disciplines today. It's also deployed in the political administration, which begins to problematize the ability of governments to function for the people. Why? Because the underlying ideology constructs societies as composed of individuals. Autonomous individuals, there is no relationality. The global knowledge structure or system remains fundamentally a white supremacist or a white privileging system, whichever term you prefer to use. As scholars, we can choose to get in the mock 
of ceaselessly responding to the absurdities that A, there is no proof that the system is racialized, or B, the system is not that bad, but in is being wrong, wrongly vilified. Or C, whatever the flaws it has, it has served us well and we can manage it. Africans are always managing. I prefer to choose a pathway that avoids the epistemic trap of seeking to understand why other human beings think that Africans then and now are inferior beings. That is not my problem. That is not what knowledge is about. It is important to fear of the well, that well-trodden part that seeks to mire Africans in pathologies. The track I've chosen to take leads to African long durée history that offers a substantially different philosophy of life and well-being. It is a track where the mode of thought and mode of thinking lie outside of or beyond the wide racialized reality, comprised of an extractive capitalist logic and a dominative ideology of de de degradation that emerged with enslavement in the Americas. If anything, enslavement modernity, as it should probably properly be called, and its inherent anti-Black logic of degradation could not and did not establish enlightenment or the presumed racial superiority of whites. Rather, what these two futures established were the psychological immaturity and twisted pathology of oppressors of other human beings. So, With global knowledge production vitally constituted by the concepts, methodologies, and interpreted, interpretive tools of enslavement modernity, we must be wary about the ideology of denigration of this hegemonic knowledge system. In the push to be modern, contemporary generations of Africans are opting for products of this globalized knowledge that force on them readings and analysis that are fundamentally racialized, gendered, structured on linear thought processes, and produces technological excesses that are profoundly unsustainable. And we're finding that now through climate change. The so-called global system that is fundamentally parochial discounts African knowledges, ideas, and beliefs that challenge the West's problematic abstraction of physical reality such as the idea that nature is lifeless and the corollary principles, concepts and theories that promote racialized thinking, gendered structuring and an unsustainable mechanistic ideology that is anchored on linear thought processes. So for Africans to advance confidently, we need to bring ourselves to the global table. With what? We must rethink what constitutes knowledge, knowing that no one group of people have all the answers. At the very least, we need to share the vast corpus of wisdom we accumulated and distilled for millennia while living on this continent. In case we have forgotten, we must study our sapiential system to get to the deeper truths they are stating about the continent and about the reality to retrieve the truth that are preserved in them. So why Sankofa? For self-knowledge to become our watchword, we must follow the injunction of the Adinkra symbol known as Sankofa. The visual symbols and its accompanying verbal truths urges us to look to the past for what is useful in transforming the present and shaping the future. 
Sankofa in Chui, the Akan language of Ghana and Southeastern Ivory Coast, exhorts us to go back and fetch it. It functions as a concept, it embodies a methodology, it is a visual symbol and a theoretical statement all in one. As visual symbol, it is part of an extensive corpus of symbols known as Adinkra that was developed in the Bono region and named after then community leader, Nana Kofi Adinkra. The term Adinkra decomposes into two words, Adin, which means name, and Kra, that stands for send a message or send a greeting. The symbols are dense abbreviated messages that culturally literate receivers relationally deconstruct to understand. So the fact that you see the symbol doesn't mean you understand what it is. The symbols would come with a name. The symbol has an expression, but merely seeing the symbol and the expression doesn't end there. That is when this deeper truths or analyzing of those truths begin. Thus, Adinkra, the classificatory name of this corpus of over hundreds of symbols means A, a name or form that sends a message. Like all Adinkra symbols, Sankofa also sends a message to an audience that can be apprehended visually, received as an express expansive philosophical statement, deployed as a dense theoretical treatise that calls for exempli exemplification, analysis, or put into motion as a methodology. So it's a compact, complex tool. As a philosophical treatise, it assesses a philosophy of critical remembrance, a theory of knowledge about remembering, a theory of time and speciality, and an ontology of being. Furthermore, furthermore, Adinkra leads us to unveil other theories of knowledge that are embedded in local traditions but that had become obscured by the violent colonial processes of domination, shaming, and erasure. These extensive caches of knowledge and theories are about the physical world and humans that were articulated progressively over millennia by a long unbroken chain of generations of knowledge producers operating in diverse traditions. So traditions vary. Those who are in the arts, they work in the arts, talk about the arts, the implications of the arts. So that's one arena. Those who are in the political administration, the discussions go on in terms of those political decisions that are made and the ways in which people behave in the context within in the audience of the Ashante Hene or the Ashante Hema. You move to the sociological terrain, there's a, another discussion going on. In agriculture, there's a tradition. So areas of knowledge of the society compromises and constitutes traditions that are discussed. So in the strict narrow sense, Sankofa epistemology can be construed as synonymous with African philosophy, since it is intricately composed of values, concepts, principles, and theories that speak to various African sapiential systems of knowledge developed by societies and communities while interacting in their different environments with neighbors and with the cosmos. In other words, Sankofa epistemology is genuinely an African philosophy in ways that current African philosophy that are European based or responding to current Western disciplinary philosophy are not.
in highly specific ways, Sankofa epistemology offers a vision of reality, canons and corpuses of ideas about relationality and being human that challenges the individualistic, egoistic model of human being found in Western philosophy. It speaks unequivocally about experientiality as the basis of true knowledge. It expands human cognition beyond visual and oral clues to include echolocation, consciousness extension, embedding and embodiment. Time is coiled or rolled rather than linear. It is a coiled cyclical spiral. The procedural methodology of critical remembrance facilitates the retrieval of all manner of data, conceptual, political, social, ethical, economic, religious, cosmological, and agricultural principles that previous generations had produced. The millennia deep corpus of knowledge is important given that they explain who we are as peoples and the values we hold. Because the past is integral to the future, Sankofa epistemology is essential for recentering and re-engaging the experiential, spiritual, and abstract knowledges that communities produced. For insistence, the Bantu principle, which everybody here knows, Umuntu, Ngumuntu, Ngabantu, a human is human because of other humans. It's an illustration of an ethics of being that Sankofa epistemology centers. When you center this concept, you are centering the interpolation of our humanness in the humanness of others. You are in endorsing and underscoring relationality, which moves us away from the flawed racialized notion of rights and autonomous individualism that are part of a terrain of concepts, assumptions, and theories with deep exclusivist roots in European ideology of domination. You cannot have relationality as the basis that holds humans together and put it aside and work on a model that speaks of humans as isolated individuals. It doesn't work. And insofar as any government rests on liberalism, parliamentary democracy, and at the basis is about individualism and individual rights constructed in the autonomous model, you are not speaking about humanity and relationality. What is it that makes us human? And one way we can determine that is centering the agency, centering the importance and values of people. A, go a government that cannot center its people because we are worried about economic issues and the IMF is going to kick our butts and we have to do this. It's not talking about the people first. Rather, it's devising a whole set of battery of excuses to explain the fact that the model is it is working with is that individualistic model that does not recognize, nor see, nor appreciate, nor apprehend your value as humans. So humans have to be put on a lower pedestal to make sure that economics or capitalism works. Whereas a model of relationality will have to ask capitalism to work for humans. So you have to upturn the model, but we cannot upturn the model as long as we link ourselves and are hooked to that global structure of meaning and knowledge production. And we do not see ourselves for what we bring to the table. If we do not see ourselves for what we bring to the table, we cannot argue our case. We cannot tell people who we are. We cannot be proud of our values. We cannot insist on our values. And guess what? 
Many people around the world are crying for those who will lead and talk about the importance of humanity or human beings at the center of life. Not humans at the periphery of life, serving the abstract market forces that capitalism has constructed. Everything goes back to the basis. I'm going to skip some of that uh, because the issue of Ubuntu is very well known here. People have talked about it, it's part of the constitution, but it's part of the constitution of South Africa, but it hasn't been literally implemented in the way it should. That is going to be the challenge of South Africa. And perhaps now it's joining the BRICS. It might be able to do something, hopefully. But let me move on from that. Because once I begin to get into the, the, the chapters of the book, there are areas that I, for one, found mind boggling. And I'll get to it in a moment. So argu I um, argument deals with the outline. In a highly important way, Sankofa epistemology uncovers a correctly structured world of relationality, interactivity, and synchronicity that undermines the validity of a cosmos that peddles a knowledge of binarisms, oppositionalities, dichotomies, racial hierarchy, and gender. Gender finds its life in that framework not in the framework of relationality. It is a philosophy of critical remembrance that helps uncover long forgotten theories, methodologies, histories, events, values, and practices that were embedded in local traditions, but which the violent processes of colonialism had obscured. The relational sociologic of Sankofa epistemology is grounded in holistic, relational and interactive realities with chapter one, encountering Sankofa ontology and endogenous African knowledge brings into sharper relief. It begins with a 1993 film by the Ethiopian American filmmaker, Haile Gerima. And the film was called Sankofa. The film opens with a conceptualized reality that is African and that is grounded on an African logic of time and speciality. Garima reveals this in a filmic treatment of time and space through a sophisticated process and remembering. He constructs a palpable reality that is a vital living force or energy in which state, space and time interweave to conceptualize humans as solidified forms of energy slash force created in stages of time. Thinking of time and space in this mode as an interactional and, inter and as interactional and interrelational evacuates the global ideology of global colonialism and its paradigm of discrete segmentation. So if you move into this ideology that makes up the social logic talks about interrelation, interrelationality. What it does is force out of the space that and the other competing ideology that sees everything as segmented, individuals, everything segmented, Segmentation by itself is not bad. We segment to, uh, to understand something very critically. But if after our segmentation, we need to understand that the discrete segments are not the whole, that we really cut off the whole to be able to see parts. But having seen the parts, we need to bring it back together. The problem is that having cut off the parts, we leave it there, and then we ask the question, so how do they relate? The very first time you got it, 
That was how it was before you cut it up. What is the solution after you cut it up? Oh, we have to discover through science and AI how we can create things that will mechanically bring all these things together. The apple that was one that you then cut up, now you need AI to put it together for you. And then you turn around to say, we discover something very important. We're not able to theorize how we can or how nature brought all these things together. It's as if you forgot you had a knife before and you cut up the apple. And before you cut up the apple, the apple was one. So that problem of breaking things up and then finding that the only way you can comprehend that it's whole is to mechanically bring it together or fabricate how it can be put together. So Garima's film presents an African narrative as a paradigm that visually shatters notion of spatial temporality of enslavement modernity. And what he had done was to give us a, a picture of an African American actress who goes to Ghana, to the slave coasts, the slave castles, and is uh, in bikini and is having a photo shoot by a white photographer. And then she changes and she's decked out in this fabulous glide and flipping around and she looks nice. But she wasn't thinking of where she was standing. She was standing in the slave castle below where the dungeons, where her ancestors had been kept and then transported from the back door to the ocean, the vessels waiting there and the crossing of the Atlantic occurred. So while she was doing that, she entered what you can call a time war. Suddenly, she was no longer Mona, the actress. She found herself in the middle of the plantation and her name is Shola. Now, Shola Mona, same actress acting it, but what Gerima is telling you is that your lineage, your ancestry is written in you. And so she can harness her history that she didn't know she had access to, but it wasn't just getting close to that history, she actually lived it. So the film was about two hours, but that mode of remembering occurs instantaneously. It's like you walk through a chasm, a whole set of things happens to you, you come out at the other end, and it's as if you, you are startled. For some, it could be you're standing, and some may call it a vision, some may call it a, a, a dream, some will just say, I don't know what happened. But those are things that happen about and tell us about critical remembering. But critical remembering is not remembering in abstraction. It's a remembering of who you are as a person, who your ancestors have been, what their experiences are. It's not just the DNA the chemical composition of the DNA or the mitochondria. We are talking of the experiential that they lived through. So slavery and enslavement in the US constructed them as property. And on, as properties, they are ledgers on a book. They have no names, they're nameless. They don't have a lineage, they don't have a history. But what Gerima is saying is that you have a history, regardless of what the slave master has told you, you have a history and you can access that history. And that history belongs to you. You can channel it. 
which was what he put Shola and Mona to do. That Mona now recognizing what he meant and in recognizing what it meant, it transformed her whole notion of resistance before she was compliant, before she believed it was her fault that she was enslaved, that she was property, and that every night the master has total use of brutal, sexually brutalizing her. And of course, if she has a child, that child is not the master's child. That child is the master's property. Because what slavery did is absolve men the right of paternity of the products of rape. So you now have the legal right to rape your properties and increase your wealth by having them have children. The more children they have, the more your property grows. And the more it grows, you can decide to sell some of them off or you can decide to put them to work as they get bigger. And stories have occurred where even the man that raped the 14 year old child now also rapes his own child that he produced with that 14 year old girl because it's his property. He can do anything with it. So when we talk of slavery and what it connotes and people being property, the visceral aspect of it is never captured by the words or the theoretical analysis until you begin to see what actually it does to humans. It wasn't until she was able to go back in time that Shola was now able to remerge her broken selves. Okay? And Africans are oftentimes dismissed as not having any theoretical knowledge or anything of importance. So chapter three, called Sankofa Knowledge, Cosmological Order and Numeration System. So it sets out to understand not just the conception of time, but the conception of speciality that makes it possible. So we are I'm going to begin with this Yoruba Oriki, which is similar to the Adinkra terminologies. And it states, Eshu, the divinity, turns night into wrong. So it begins with this. Eshu is the divinity that throws a stone today and kills a bird yesterday. As she throws a stone today and kills a bird yesterday. So before arriving at this enigmatic conclusion, the Oriki first enumerates the superlative qualities of the Orisha. As she will turn right into wrong, it will turn right, wrong into right. When he is angry, he hits a stone until it bleeds. When he is angry, he sits on the skin of an ant. When he's angry, he weeps tears of blood. And then it ends with, he throws a stone today and kills a bird yesterday. The question is, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> So the Oriki is stating an important fact about cosmology and about the numeration system of the Yorubas, who as a people have had their knowledge system dismissed as myth, punitive and untheoretical. The idea that no African language can transmit theoretical knowledge means that, they, that many unhear what that Oriki is asserting. 
First, it is making a profound metaphysical statements about cosmic speciality, as well as epistemology, an epistemological one about the nature of time. It is not stating as many wrongly assume that time runs backwards. It is stating a pertinent condition about physical reality and relationality, which is that given the chasm between the rarefied realm of the Orisha and humans, Eshu's act is relationally apprehended by us in what symbolically counts as Eshu's yesterday. Think about it this way. Africans know about energy because they begin that the cosmos is composed of energy. Yorubas will call it a ship. We call it Owa. Even the Bakongo, ha everybody has their own and the universe cosmos is always conceptualized as energy and as waves. We can go to the next one. So because of this conceptualization of the, um, of the world, it has an impact on time and how um, things work. So the, astros, the, the, the clearest way of le really understanding what is being said is the concept of time dilation that the, uh, any divinity is at a level, rarefied level of operation, very different from that of humans where we are at a more sluggish type of life. So the act of issue of throwing the stone, we apprehended issues yesterday. So it's actually an oriki that is telling you about time and space under certain conditions, but utilizing the divinity Oshu to do it. So speaking about the condition of time presupposes a tradition of scholarship. In a study of Oshu, Odechundi, Odechunji, Odejobi, a computational Specialist working on the Yoruba enumeration system elaborated on the complexity of the number system. He discloses that the uniqueness of the system is the development of numeration for use in intellectual discourses apart from counting. For instance, the Yoruba possessed the binary complementary system of the Oduifa in its forms of base extension, basically base four, base eight, and base 16. 16 is a spiritual prime number. Consider the number of completion. In the octal and hexadecimal systems, 16 is the number of calories of the eridilogum divination systems, and the 16 crossroads of Ije, empowered mothers. The Yoruba used the base five system in reckoning days and calendars, base eight and 16 for spiritual calculation and base 10 for economic computations. In total, they operated seven base extension, principally base two, which is the binary numeral system, base four, quaternary numeral system, base five, Quinary numeral system, base eight, octal numeral system, base 10, decimal numeral system, base 16, hexadecimal numeral system, and base 20, the decimal numeral system. This begs the question, what the heck were they calculating? <laughs> Keeping an eye on the time and knowing that I have two very important people who are going to be jumping all over what I have said. I am going to round up. The, the study goes further. 
the following chapter, after examining this reason for the numerous system, which I have to um, specify, is not restricted to the Yoruba. Many African system uh, uh, communities have these numbers of numeral systems. We don't know about it because we don't study it. What is part of our traditions, but one of the things that was even more by mind boggling is that the calculations occur with our computers. And in one of the research work that was done, they could count up to 35.2 trillion without needing a calculation, a calculator, which raises the question, how? So they have methods for doing what they are doing. So the next chapter looks at this mode of knowledge, but looks also at the fact that there's an element of the experiential. Many systems of knowledge do not believe you know if your teacher told you. They do not believe you have certitude in knowledge if you read it in books. Knowledge comes after you have experienced it. So if they specify something that is part of their traditions, that sounds mind boggling, you can harness, you can reach to your ancestors. They will show you how to do it. They have principles of flight. They will show you how to do it. But it's a system of knowledge that is predicated on experimentation of one for you to experiment it before you can claim to know. So every other thing is merely beliefs, informed beliefs. Knowledge is when you have experienced it. So from that, I go on to the next chapters that deals with the location and the status of women as the first environmental scientists and uh, geologists. And I'm looking at that in ways in which they created uh, pottery and terracotta. Before terracotta, there was no ve uh, vessels. How did they know that you need fire to burn clay at a particular temperature before it turns and becomes earthenware? They were practicing this 10,000 years ago. And women were those in the lead. So there's quite a bit of things that other chapters begin to unfold to make a case that when we talk about Sankofa epistemology, it's not the same old story of, oh yeah, we're just scratching our head and talking about something we know, we don't know. But actually, there's a methodology and there's a procedure of knowledge behind what we claim to know. And it's not just limited to evaluative or moral principles and tenets. It also includes things that fall under the arena of science. They don't call it science, but it falls under that arena. So on that note, thank you for listening. And I'm going to share this with you. And I'll start um, by saying that I appreciate the work done by Professor Zengu, um, being exposed to this kind of knowledge is really new for me as a postgrad student. You know, I did not have an idea around sound waves, numbers, um, which were confusing to some, um, which are really important in understanding the scholarship around Sankofu. And I'm not saying I'm appreciating the, the work because Prof is my lecturer. <laughs> I'm saying this because of her contribution to um, African philosophy. And third years would understand if they are doing um, African studies that some of our knowledge systems and the ways in which um, Africa is studied 
it's very westernized um the representation of africa in literature um is extroverted um and also the idea around the study of africa um and what african scholars produce is seem to be defective illegitimate as prophet argued um but i'm not going to be long here and i'm going to pose a few questions to prof that were really interesting on my end um number one um with this background around african study or um going back um how do you deviate from um the idea around um that african philosophers or the challenge that african philosophers have um in starting on a colonial footing so when you were um, researching around sankofu how did you deviate away um, from that colonial um, footing the the second question that i i want to interrogate is the question around capitalism and how capitalism should work for humans I I I'm interested to understand um, how the practicality of this, um, you know, because you know what uh, capitalism is problematic, uh, neo colonialism is problematic, and all of these principles, um, and. On the idea then of Sankofu, our history as Africans, um, we come from a very colonial traumatic experience. And what I want to understand really, maybe Prof can um, elaborate more, is how do we subconsciously awake um, those ideas? Because, you know, taking into consideration our colonial history. Um, and so um, those are some of the my kind of interest that I had when she was doing her lecture. Um, you know, the idea of fetching something um, in, an, in an African context, I, I want to understand how that will play out. Um, Yes, I think I will just end it there. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Am I audible? So my name is Ompuru Sanengwakuru, and I am a master's candidate in the department. I remember that when I was drafting my proposal, one thing that I struggled with the most was finding readings that spoke to what I wanted to write about, being Ravenda women pre-colonialism that occupied positions of power and that were leaders in their respective communities. But when I spoke to my mom, she said that she had heard and that these things existed. But when I went into archives, which mostly are written by Western and European scholars, this part of history was not recorded. Therefore, I began to doubt if indeed these women were there and existed. I told myself that if this knowledge is not easy to attain, and if Western scholars are not saying much about it, clearly it does not exist. I simply dismissed it without interrogation or question. In my dismissal, it meant that I was adding another layer of legitimizing and affirming this narrative or simply saying, yes, it's true, they don't exist. It meant that I was dismembering and internally I was erasing a group of women and adding to the problem simply because of there was lack of a Western encoded history about them. Now I ask myself, how many things have I heard about Africa and simply because there's no answer, I dismiss it. And a lot of people sitting here, how many stories, how many proverbs, how many things that seemed as if they were out of this world, they were mythical, and therefore you dismiss it without interrogating if it is true, because we often consume Western knowledge and we dismiss any African knowledge that exists. Similar to what African scholars do when they cannot explain a phenomenon in Africa, they simply sideline and disregard it as abnormal or, usual be and, or unusual because they cannot explain it. They write millions of work to validate that the knowledge that they are saying and what they've written is what is true, and we all begin to internalize it, even us as Africans, and we begin to doubt our own history. 
yet when we st yet when we do when we do stop and questions and question them for hundreds of years european people they came and then they degraded and shamed and violated africans yet what do africans do and their knowledge systems are seemingly abnormal yet you are shaming and degrading them isn't that also abnormal and unusual therefore i do agree and i do support that there are many knowledges and theories throughout our generations that need to be broken down and interrogated in Africa. It is important for us to not simply validate the knowledge that already exists, which is from a Western perspective. I like the time when you make prof when you made a reference to Mona being oblivious to her inner self and how this is reflective of many Africans. It's very reflective of many people here where we become very oblivious to our inner selves. And this is because how do you explain for the longest time when you've been told who you are? and they've painted a picture of who you are, you simply fall into the trap of believing that that's who you are. And a lot of African people, we fell into that trap of being told who we are. So when you speak about this history that is encoded within us, how do we then tap into it when I've been told who I am for the longest time and what I read about is very negative and very degrade, degrading of me. In chapter three, you speak of, uh, your uh, numbers, the number system. And I would like to say that I find this very interesting, referring to a book by Czech Anta Diop, which is called, just need to find, it's called The Origin of, The African Origin of Civilization. Here, Prof speaks about Yoruba and this number system that existed, which sounded very complex, talking about base six, base eight, base 12. But what I find interesting in this book is how Czech Antetwop also speaks about how the very early, early lives of civilization happened in Africa. And he speaks about how a white man went into now known as Egypt. There was mathematics, there was engineering, but what happened? It showed that there was a certain level of intellect that existed amongst Africans. But the stories that we now read today take away from that. When a white man himself was saying, when I got there, I witnessed that these people were very advanced and we took that from them, but we don't interrogate that. This reminds me very well of a scholar called um, Susan Strange who speaks about power and refers to knowledge as a structural, a tenant of structural power and speaks about how one who holds uh, knowledge production can shape narratives and influence our ideas and beliefs. And I do very much agree that it can happen. It, it is like that. They shape the way that we think and what we believe in our narratives. So you speak about the Sankofa epistemology and talk about this critical remember, remembering of salient forgotten theories events, values, and practices, how do we go about doing that? How does, how does one remember in time and how do we maintain whatever that we've remembered? Uh, I also want to know about the time when you speak about time and space and physics. It's a very complex idea. I want you to sort of unpack to us and how this relates to Sankofa and this epistemology that you're speaking about. I also want to understand the history that you say that is encoded into us, the same history that was encoded into Mona. How do we now here as these students trying to understand, how do we get closer to that? How do we tap into that? So that we also uncover or discover this history that is encoded within us. And then you also spoke about humans being placed or how to achieve this is by placing human at, humans at a lower pedestal. And you also spoke about that rate of capitalism is at the center of it. And as we all know, capitalism drives the world that we currently live in. So therefore, how do we navigate all of this together? And I also the last thing that I wanted to understand is you speak about, or for us to achieve this, we need some sort of subconscious awakening and in this world that we live in, there's so many distractions. How do we even reach that level of subconscious awakening to question the things that are happening? Because a lot of us, we also know the saying that says, Thomas Galvona. So a lot of things that are happening, it's like we have to see them for us to believe that they exist. So how do we tap into what you were speaking of? Thank you. Okay, then I'm going to hand over to Hi, I'm, I, I'm, I am conscious of time and I, 
really want to thank Prof, Prof Nzengu and our fantastic discussants for really giving us um, so much to think about. And the good thing is that Prof is coming back next year for some of these questions. Um, she will be able to respond to them, okay? But really, hang on. I mean, the, the time that we have talking about time and space is not enough in thinking about this big project. I just want to take one or two comments and I'm going to invite Prof to just respond to the questions that have been raised by the discussants by way of concluding. Do we have a burning question for, Prof, for Professor Nzengu? Okay. <laughs> okay. I have a bit of a longish question. I hope you don't mind. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But given the spiritual incursions that happened as a result of colonialism, first in the north. North of Africa coming down, then the second in Southern Africa going up. I don't want to say, but I, I'm hoping you know what I'm talking about. And, and how these attacks constituted spiritualities that were markedly different, in fact, if not in contradiction to, to what our ancestors had constructed. I, I think there is what we can call the conqueror's time that we live in, that we live in a conquered time. The fact that we, we start in January and not September in this side of the hemisphere, at least. Um, beyond the sort of material. And again, these philosophies have constructed, I guess, for formerly colonized beings, both a physical and metaphysical reality. And I think at some point we have to deal with a metaphysical reality and how that constituted our structures of reality. And I think we need to deal with that first before getting into the sort of material reality that you were talking about around capitalism, political aspects and the sociological. So for me, the concept around critical remembrance, how do you locate, I guess, the sort of like of a back to word, sort of the spiritual revolution that I'm alluding to here with, within this critical remembrance. Because I think that's quite important, I guess, in a what would be a final revolution for Africans. Thank you. I'm going to invite Prof to respond by way of concluding as well. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be quick. First of all, um, in my past life, when I used to go or hear of people go to church, they would say that the long sermon in the evening is not advisable. Everybody's tired and they want to go to sleep <laughs> or they want to go to eat. So I'm mindful of that. So I'm not going to enter into a long discussion, which we can have one-on-one. Um, -on -one. But quickly, I think there's an important point that you're you are making. One of the things I don't subscribe to is there's a, regime, a regimented model of approaching things. Things happen in very different ways, which is to say, you don't do this first, and you do the second, and then you do the third. Because that's another linearity of thought and motion that doesn't work very well. And let me use that to tie, to bring to the four uh, Luna's point, which is how do we begin to even think about, understand, and move out. One of the things I would urge and recommend people to do is to begin to write things about your life and your experiences that you have found inexplicable. How did these things happen? Begin with yourself and begin writing it down. Because oftentimes we quickly dismiss it and we don't want to look at it. 
what are we dismissing? Because those are the clues that begin to open up and uncoil that coiled time that is in you. When it happened to Mona, she wasn't expecting it. And oftentimes when it happened to you, and I can bet a lot of you have had those type of experiences that you will say, thank God I didn't go. Because shortly after you heard that that location you were going to, something happened. Or that car you were going to um, take crashed. But you felt a compulsion to keep back. Begin to note that and begin to tabulate and calculate it. What I'm saying is study yourselves. We don't study ourselves. We study this. We come to class, we study whatever readings we are told to study. But you, you also happen to be books. Every single one of you, you are books that you need to study to understand fully who you are and what you are. Another thing that I would say in terms of the practicality of um, capitalism, well, I threw that in. We know the problems of capitalism and capitalism is to see humans, even though people would want to argue that a particular point, making profit is not necessarily capitalism, which is what we keep thinking. That when you go to the market, you sell, you make money. Oh, that's a capitalist in the making. Capitalism is a structure that was created and designed on a means of production so that you can generate maximum profit at the expense of people whose labor you control. It's not a one thing you go to the market, you sell the oranges and you make money. How many oranges are you going to sell to turn into a, um, um, a capitalist? How many trees are you going to own? How many fruits are you going to ensure will ripen? So there is a randomness to this where people survive or where people live their lives and trade. So trading doesn't necessarily translate into capitalism. So we need to be very clear on that. So capitalism does have its problematics because it's built on a construction of humanity as labor being deployed to produce the resources that is required. And it evolves. It evolves, you have the naive capitalism and it, um, it, it evolved in, uh, over forms. 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century. Now we are going to enter the age of the AI capitalism and God save us. Because for those who pay attention to the issue of artificial intelligence, AI, the problem comes in that the AI is taught and refined based on a corpus of data that is scraped from the internet. And that corpus of data has nothing redeeming to say about black people. And that's what is being utilized to train it. The language is going to, that it speaks, that is used to train it, primarily English, it already discriminates even when you apply for a job in the United States. The first person that reads anybody's application is AI. And what they noted is that the AI will routinely throw out the applications of women. Because you just look through, find women, classes, feminist classes, out. So it was reproducing what it had learned, even as the narrative is, it's objective. We've cleaned the data. How can you clean a data that is fundamentally gendered? 
and racist. Some TikTok people want to take a picture of themselves, black women, professional photos. It turned them into what they called booty mama. Booty mama. No. This, is, this pops out the very opposite of professional. Because that's what it understands that black women like and black women look like. So what I've been doing for the past two years is going through the data, the big data that was used or is still being used to train AI. So when they say train AI, you need to ask yourself, what is the material that they are using to train it? Who's training? What is the yardstick? What is the metrics that is being applied? And if the metrics is that Africans or black people never have wealth, it's already biased against you. And if that's going to be the very first thing you meet in anything you are doing globally, internationally, and even if you are going for visa these days, is the AI that will process your work. It will determine whether you qualify. And sometimes it's the name that it picks up. And you cannot convince, you cannot get access to a human being to tell the human being, this is wrong. So we are going to enter another type of marginalization and exclusion. But how did I do the shift? Given that we started with a philosophy that is anchored on British philosophy, British and uh, Anglo philosophy, continental philosophy is also um, European. How did you break out? How did I run out of the zoo without the guards knowing that I have run out? It comes to a point in time that it begins with the very first question. Is there African philosophy? Which is to say, can Africans think? What is philosophy in any case? Can Africans think? And you found respected scholars with PhDs in philosophy, theorizing, no, we don't have philosophy. We have ethno thoughts. So when you find the Africans who were my teachers, demeaning themselves by not seeing the, the absurdity of the question. You know that there's something wrong with this system. And that's a system I'm not interested in belonging. I did say earlier in my test, I'm the kind of girl, pull down the house and burn it. That's what I believe. So it meant that I had to begin to find a way out of that. Look for readings that sound correct or people who understood what the logic. But ultimately I have to go back to my family because I was raised by parents who did not believe in the validity or the superiority of the white man. Let me confess, my father trained in the UK as an attorney. He spent most of his time hanging out with the radicals who were critiquing the system, people like Bernard Shaw. So when he came back, he was still the person he was. But we come from a community God is Ethiopia, who will argue till death. And that's what my community is known for. We will argue until we enter the spirit and we're still arguing over there. What is that? It's philosophy. So it was something that was known and certain communities are marked and known for that. 
And so for me, I had to claim, reclaim my history. So how do you find that knowledge in you? Take seriously your family histories. It's not a case of, I have to find one chief who is there who will tell me and I will find your family histories. Understand the location of your family, what they have done. There's incredible stories of South Africans through the period of apartheid, of women, of men, but he had with the system. It wasn't just the male men doing it. It was those are narratives that become the tools that point to you deeper stories that you didn't hear, nobody told you because you never asked. And you have to ask yourself, those who stood up to fight at that point of apartheid, who taught them? They had nobody to teach them. They didn't even have education like you had. They didn't even have the history of freedom that you, have, you are now enjoying. And if they can do it, and see the inequities and understand the injustice that they are living through. You guys don't have a reason of saying, how do we learn? It's all open. And Luna talked of Sheikh and Tijuan. People have been writing books on this. As you are reading those books, Bring yourselves and your histories to the table because they are very important. On that basis, uh, I will close and I will try and keep away from issue of religion. Religion, Christianity, and Islam. Perfect. It's still on. Yes, it's still on. Thank you very much. I think we have a, a lot to think about and to place ourselves in what we need to do. So, Prof's advice that we must start with ourselves, with our family histories, is one that I think you should take very seriously. So, thank you very much. There's food outside. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.